Ladies and gentlemen, we now direct your attention to Commissioner Coons Bach, situated at the home plate side of the Red Sox dugout, where the ceremonial first pitch will be thrown out on behalf of the President of the United States by the Secretary of the Treasury, William E. Simon. Mr. Simon, being greeted by a few booze, they have the highest oil prices in America here in New England. But no matter what public office you're where you go, they cheer you, they boo you. Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner of baseball, is in charge. The, it's a light rain falling down. However, as we told you, the wind is coming from first base toward third or out of the right field corner. And we see light skies over there. So I think this shower is going to pass by. That's the direction of the wind. That's up and back of third base. Balls hit in the air toward the Cincinnati bullpen or toward the right field grandstand are going to be held up. Here are the Red Sox. They'll get a mighty roll. <laughs> Just French to left field. Lynn is in center, Evans in right. Very well might be the best defensive outfield in baseball. Get some argument from the Red fans, the other clubs, but they can all throw and cover ground, and they're very accurate throwers. Even the Cincinnati Scott reports rate them the best that they played against, potentially. In the infield, Petroselli's at third. At short is Burleson. At second is Doyle. At first is Cooper. And there he is. He says he's 35. People say going on 45. His father's here, 70 years old. His father was one of the greatest pitchers in the history of Cuba. He pitched also in the Negro American League. Did not want his son to uh, pitch in baseball. We'll tell you that story later, Tony. All right, Curtin Dick, let's go to the man who's going to catch him in today's ball game. And that, of course, is Carlton Fitz. He'll be calling the pitches. Let's hear what Carlton had to say about Luis Tian. Baseball game against the Cincinnati Reds. What might he throw them? But what will be the big thing right. for him? Well, Tony, I think he'll go with his basic game, which is basically aggressive game. He has four good pitches that he can throw for strikes at any time with a multitude of variations on each pitch. Uh, I look for him to be aggressive today and try to get ahead of the hitters. I think Dick Stockton will tell you we'll know right away about Tion. If Louis Tion has his control, he'll be all right. And, of course, that's where you'll see the head feints and all the body fakes that uh, he likes to do. He's a, people call him an exotic type of a pitcher. If he doesn't have his control, he'll be in trouble. And, of course, he has to get his fastball in there. The umpires today, they're all working in their first World Series. Behind the plate will be Art France of the American League. Nick Calusi of the National League working at first. Larry Barnett of the American League at second. Dick Stello of the National League at third. He's a Boston, Massachusetts man, by the way. Down the left field line, covering will be George Maloney of the American League, and Satch Davidson of the National League is working the right field line. One of baseball's best players over a long stretch, Pete Rose, batting 317, a switch hitter. Great fan of the game. He knows every batting average of every player in the major league. Ball one to him. You fans know all about these players. You've studied them all year and followed them on NBC's Game of the Week, Monday Night Baseball. We're going to let you watch a lot of the action. The play row slightly toward left. Fouls it into the seats. A ball and a strike to Pete Rose. The on deck batter, little Joe Morgan. And then you get into the big boys Johnny Bench, Perez, and Foster. That's Morgan. That last pitch was a good sign for Tion. He had the ball by Pete Rose, and if he's got his good fastball, it'll set up his off-speed stuff. He has six different pitches that come from everywhere. There's a change-up. That's foul out of play. I asked him about his knuckleball. He says, no throw knuckleball. Knuckleball, no good. <laughs> he is a wit of the ballpark. The fans, he may be one of the most beloved players the Red Sox have ever had. 
He was washed up a few years ago with a bad arm and came back. A miraculous comeback. One ball, two strike delivery. High and away, two and two. The A's said last week he had better than an average major league fastball. And of course, that makes all these other dipsy doodle stuff look pretty good. Two and two count to Pete Rose. We're just underway. There's his hesitation pitch. That's his hesitation pitch. <laughs> Look at Pete. <laughs> Pete says, what is that? What was that? <laughs> Throw me another one. <laughs> he borrowed that a, a page out of Satchel Page's book. <laughs> Three and two. <laughs> and Rose hammers a fastball foul in the seat. Well, this is what Rose likes to do, uh, stay alive and wait for his pitch. Tion did not win 20 games for the first time in three seasons, uh, Kurt. However, in the month of September, once his back problems were solved, he was as good as old. Rose hit a fastball off young Candelera down there in game three of the National League for a home run. He's a great fastball hitter. There's another foul. Rose will do the hang in there tough on you. He's a tough out. He gets a piece of the ball most of the time. It was Pete, whose wife Carolyn taped some of the championship series games, watching Tion. He studies this game, and a difficult thing for the Cincinnati ball club, I think, Kurt Dick, is to be able to pick up Tion's pitches. He throws sidearms sometimes over the top three quarters, and you just lose a split second. And he had another 200 hit season, seven for him. He's chasing Ty Cobb's record. There's a bounding ball to Denny Doyle. Big hop to him. There's the first out of the first game. One away. We, we may have in this series, and it's usually fitting that we do, the two most valuable players in their respective leagues. This is a heavy favorite to win the National League, Joe Morgan, and Fred Lynn is a favorite to become the most valuable player in the American League. A remarkable story because he's a rookie. Morgan's been around. Now, Morgan has everything, and maybe like Sugar Ray, inch for inch and pound for pound, he may be the strongest batter in baseball. Look at those credentials. And he can hit a line drive into the right field grandstand here very easily. He's a pull hitter, and he'll pull the ball sharply into the corner. And the corner here is not too far away. He has a line shot to Doyle. He down. Well, they've done what they did against the A's. They've kept the rabbits off the baseline so far. Absolutely, and of course, the Morgan, like so many of the other Reds, are uh, uh, dead fastball hitters, and Louie gave him a breaking ball right there, and so we can expect to see a lot of that this afternoon. Here's the big gun in the Cincinnati lineup. 28 homers, another 100 RBI season, hit 283. He finished, the, he didn't hit well in the playoffs. He had only uh, one out of 13. He had a groin pull the last month, but he was swinging well yesterday in his warm-up. There's a pick to the sky. That's his head job saluting the man upstairs. Nothing in one. He's fun to watch. Not fun to hit against. Two down, nobody on. Johnny Bench the batter. First inning. They have a shift on against that. I'll tell you an interesting st a statistic, and it's a very odd statistic. Johnny Bench hit over 50 foul home runs this year. 50 foul homers. Now, with a 315-foot wall, some of those foul balls may not be foul by the time they get to the wall. Two-strike delivery. Flying away. Kurt, that's one of the reasons why Bench pulls so many balls foul the left field corner, because they change speeds. I mean, he's an excellent fastball hitter. They pull the string a lot. One-two pitch. Throw him a high fastball. He just showed him that one. Get him thinking a little bit. Two and two. Another tremendous right-handed sluggers on deck, Tony Perez, who should be at home in this ballpark. Two down, bases empty. Two-two pitch. Way inside, three and two. Dick, there's Perez. Tion does not look as sharp to me with his control as he did against the A's in the playoffs. No, he, uh, he is not so far, uh, Kurt. Uh, of course, I think what he has to rely on is keeping the hitters off balance. It was successful against Oakland, and so far off the first two batters, he has been successful there, but he has fallen behind. 3-2 delivery. There's a fly ball, shallow right. Evans is waiting for it. And the Reds go quietly down. One, two, three in the top of the first. At the end of the first half inning, no score. I asked Johnny Bench before the ball game how the young but experienced in postseason play Don Gullett will pitch up here in Fenway Park, Boston with that left field wall. 
Here's Johnny. Don Gullett will be Don Gullett today. He has, he knows no other way to pitch. Mostly we'll go with the fastballs. You'll see a fork ball, and we'll try to mix in a curve ball and slider against some of the left-hand pitchers. But because of the green monster, we're not going to change too much. We have our scouting reports. We're going to go to their weaknesses, and we're not going to let any green monster bother us. All right, Johnny, you size it up pretty well. You got to play your own ball game in this park. Only one left-hander starting was a winner here this year, and that was Young Waite of the uh, Cleveland Indians. But a left-hander can win here Number easily 24. if he has overpowering stuff or a sinker ball or a screw ball away from Mal Parnell used that. And Gullet is yeah. overpowering. Bill Lee is going to pitch tomorrow for the Red Sox, has that sinker Evans. ball, and he's been successful here. White Evans is the leadoff batter. This is a strange spot for him with a designated hitter. They have Cooper Benicus leading off. Here's the first pitch by Gullet, and it's fouled back, and Evans was ripping away at a fastball. Gullet's fastball rides in on you, sails away from you, has a good curve and a fork ball. He has the best active record of any pitcher in the major leagues in win and loss percent of over 100 decisions. He's won 80 and lost 41. Oh, he's pie. he can pop that ball. I want to tell you, he's just 24. Real greatness ahead of him. Broken thumb, missed two months, and still won 15 games this year and lost only four. Swinging late on him, a ball and two strikes. Denny Doyle's on deck, and then Yastrzemski. The way they've been getting him out, uh, Kurt, uh, Dwight Evans, is to feed him some uh, off-speed pitches. But if you make a mistake, he can take you deep. Oddly enough, that bottom uh, piece of literature shows Gullet has already pitched in a World Series. There's a ground ball, base hit. Back Gullet. There goes his no-hitter. Gullet is starting his fifth World Series game. Is only 24, and 35-year-old Teons never pitched in a World Series game. Kurt, that was Gullet's fourth ball. He'll throw eight or ten of them during the course of the game. But in this ballpark, I think it's very important that he establishes he can get a change of speed pitch over the plate. If they keep laying back to the fastball, eventually he'll get hurt. He'll go some games throw eight, nine out of ten pitches fastball. There's Danny Doyle. What a name for the Red Sox. What a job he did after he joined them from the Angels. Hitting 298. He's an excellent bunner, by the way. The best bunner on the Red Sox. One of the things the Red Sox did to get them here, Kurt, uh, they executed well. They played good, sound, fundamental baseball, including moving the runner over, hitting the cutoff man in the outfield. These are the things that uh, the Red Sox and Denny Doyle especially excelled in. That's how you win. The Reds do the same thing. Runner on first. And the bunt. The bunt. Perez tags him out down to second and Evans. Doyle can lay that ball on a dime. Kurt, there's an indication that Daryl Johnson, the Red Sox manager, thinks it might be a low-scoring game, and of course the weather still might be a factor. Doyle and Burleson have been very effective maneuvering with the back during the season. And the roar you hear in the background as you watch the rerun is a standing ovation for Carl Yastrzemski, who uh, went back from 36 to 26, took 10 years off his life the way he played against Oakland in the American League playoffs. Car Captain Carl. The hero of the impossible dream in 67. Low and outside to him for a ball. Yastrzemski was booed here in the latter part of the year. Hit only 210 after the All-Star game. But then he ran amuck against the A's. Five out of 11. Had a homer. And fielded perfectly. Ball two. He's proven that he's a money player, Kurt. Uh, when the big games come and the money games are there, Carl Yastrzemski comes through. And he said the best play he ever made was the ball in which he cut off that extra base hit by Jackson in that third playoff game. He's the best left fielder I've ever seen. Played first base most of the year. That's ball three to him, three or nothing. Outside of Kubek, of course. <laughs> I forgot, you played well, yeah. a little bit left field, didn't you? A little bit in this park, not too often. It'll drive you up a wall sometimes. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that uh, in a a little bit about George Foster playing the left field wall. Three and nothing to Yastrzemski. One out. Evans at second. No score. He's on. Red Sox have runners on first and second. And a powerhouse right-handed batter coming up. Carlton Fisk, who hit 331. Played a little more than half the season. Had knee surgery last year and a broken arm this year. 
Kurt, when he came back, the Red Sox were six games over 500, and when he returned, they won 10 in a row, and that was their hot spot of the season. He had a great playoff, 5 out of 12 against Oakland. Now he's a pull hitter. He can also hit the ball hard on the ground into a double play. Evans at second, Yastrzemski at first, one out. No score. The game started in a light shower. The rain has stopped. It's a damp, raw day here. Fastball strike. 0 and 1 to Fisk. A left handed batter, the rookie of the year of the American League, Freddie Lynn, is on deck. Evans, the lead runner. Spensky at first. They can both run. Pop up out and back a second. Morgan backpedaling. Infield fly rule called. Batter automatically out. Runners advance at their own risk. Two down. And here's Freddie Lynn. Listen to the ovation for him. You know, Don Zimmer's been around baseball 29 years. He's an old National Leaguer. And he said, I was with the great Dodger teams. I never saw anybody have a year like this kid from the opening day of the season to the last. He never hit below 330. He never hit above 350. Led the league in doubles. Just about everything. There's a bounding ball. This will be a tough play. And everybody's safe. Here comes Evans. And Evans is out at home play. Morgan is uh, claiming that he was obstructed with. Interfered with trying to feel that ball. He was interfered with, but he's not going to argue. That's he rose it. out there too. That's the end of the first inning. No score. Here's a play that was argued on a little bit. Yastrzemski and the rule reads that he was supposed to give Morgan a path. Was interference. It was not called. Watch this play by Concepcion, getting the runner. Zimmer sending him on. Dwight Evans, Concepcion with a fine play. Perez going after one of Tiant's baffling slow deliveries for a strike. Perez hit 282 this year, 109 RBIs. There was talk of trading him away. They're glad they didn't. He had a great playoff, 5 out of 12 outside. Tony and Dick uh, Zimmer was very uh, aggressive in the playoffs, running against Oakland. That time he may have been a little bit too aggressive. First inning against the A's, he forced a mistake by Washington. Another drive to right fielder Dwight Evans. Ball is not carrying the right field today against the wind. Evans is the best defensive right fielder in the American League. Don Zimmer has been aggressive all season long as a third base coach. He feels that most of the time he'll send the man because you need a good throw. The man has to pick up the ball, and so it's paid off really for the Red Sox. Alex Bramus is the red coach. Here's a man that quietly has sneaked up on everyone, George Foster. Hit 300, had 23 homers, 78 RBIs. He should like this ballpark if he gets a pitch to pull. Red's got him from the Giants, and he's developed into quite a ball player, as has Geronimo. They made some great deals. One out, nobody on. Tion, so <laughs> he comes everywhere but between his legs, and he may do that in the ball game. Sidearm, three quarters, overhand. That's a line shot to shoot. Two down. Reds have hit two line drives for out. Well, you know, when Jim Rice got hurt, a lot of people thought it would hurt the Red Sox. They swept the A's, but defensively, it might have helped him. Carl Yastrzemski had a great playoff in left field, and Cecil Cooper is young, agile, and quick at first base, and we saw why right there. They have about four or five young stars in this team. will be a nucleus for the next ten years. Cooper is one of them. Dave Concepcion. Hit 274 for the season. Five homers, 49 RBIs, and had an excellent playoff series against the Pirates, five out of 11. Hit a home run off Candelaria in game three. What a game that youngster pitched, by the way. Strike by Tiant. The old man now is honing in, Sparky. Yeah, he's honing in. He's got the radar going now. Sparky was teasing him about his mustache yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> He's just showing himself. Just watch him. You'll see that 23 all day from the front and the back. One ball, one strike to Concepcion. Two down, nobody on, no score. Check swing. One and two. 
I think one of the great moments of the season when Louis Tion beat Jim Palmer two to nothing for the Red Sox uh, at Fenway Park as we Tion see Tion pitching again. The fans started to yell Louis, Louis, Louis. It became a big chant here, and you see why he really dazzles the folks. I think he's put together with nails and pegs. There's a changeup hit high in the air to left. Jastrzemski drifting toward the corner has room right into the green door, and that's it. Three up and three down. At the end of an inning and a half, nothing to nothing. Rico Petroselli, veteran Red Sox third baseman, starts off the second. First pitch to him is outside for a ball. Rico hit 239 this year. Had a homer against the A's in the playoffs. Ball two, Gullet walked a man in the first and was behind a couple of hitters, and now he's behind Petroselli two and nothing. He got out of a jam though when he had fist popping up and Lynn tapping out. Shows you the kind of stuff he has. He can over oh. three and nothing. He he uh, caught his spikes in the mound that time. Kurt, you can see right away what happens to left-handed pitchers in Fenway or opposing pitchers, but especially left-handers. The first two pitches he was shooting for the outside corner. You start missing out there and you can get in trouble. Three and nothing to Petroselli, a right-hander Burleson's on deck, then a left-hander Cooper. Walking. Second walk by Gullet. Gullet this year averaged just over three walks every nine innings. Seven. He's not wild. Rick He's just wild enough for that stuff he has. To, you don't dig in there. Rick Burleson, the indispensable man for the Red Sox, sticks in big hits, makes timely plays for you. A real spunky. Battling type of ball player. Kurt, I want to ask Dick something. Have they hit and run with him much during the season, Burleson? Not too much. Uh, the reason why Burleson has not hit the number two position is because he really hasn't been able to go to right field as much. Five balls in a row delivered by Don Gullett. We have no score. The first six Reds up have gone down. The Red Sox had a threat in the first, and now they have Petroselli at first base. Nobody out in the last of the second. 1 0 pitch, left the butt, fastball for a strike, 1 and 1. Pete Rose, they may try and bunt on Pete Rose. Uh, Burleson was asking everybody about Rose. Rose is uh, a star and supposed to be the only weak defensive player because that's not his position. He's playing there because they wanted him to. And he's done the job, all of Pepper Martin. 2 and 1. He's a team player. Kurt, I think a lot of the Red Sox uh, scouts feel that Rose, who doesn't mind coming in for bunt plays on artificial turf uh, may mine the natural grass here. In fact the grass may be a factor today especially after it rained. The Reds are used to artificial turf. You lay back there the ball will bounce over your head. There goes the runner and it's a base hit. It goes to glove the left. Here comes Petroselli to third. Red Sox have runners on first and third playing hit and run. Gullet so far has missed with a fastball. He's had to come in with off speed stuff. That last one looked like another fourth ball on a two and one count or a curveball, and they've hit it. I think, uh, Tony and Dick, what we may see today is the Red Sox try and take an extra base on ground balls through because the Reds may not figure in charging the ball. It's a wet, heavy grass here. Don Zimmer feels that, especially when the grass is wet, the outfielder has to come in and pick it up and make the play and then throw. He's willing to take a gamble. All right, runners on first and third, nobody out. Red Sox are threatening again. Gullet in seven batters face has given up three hits and two walks. Given up two hits, two walks. Three hits. They gave Lynn a hit. Last ball for a strike to Cooper is an excellent hitter. At 311 for the year. Four out of ten in the playoffs. He's a hitter that's getting better every month he plays. Line drive. He can hit for distance. He'll hit a lot of balls in the gap for doubles. He'll hit left handers too. Had a rip at that one. Two strikes. The Cecil Cooper. Cooper might be the best fastball hitter on this Red Sox club. It's tough to sneak a pitch by him. And with Gullet coming almost straight over the top, he's not going to back you out of the box if you're a left handed hitter. Cooper will hang tough. Petroselli at third, Burleson at first, nobody out. There's a foul ball. 
Beller trying to blow the fastball by him. Lead runner Petroselli. Burleson at first. No score. Last half the second. 26 years old is Cecil Cooper. Most of the players in this team are 23, 22, 24, 25, and 6. He's high with it. I'd say that uh, the Red Sox team is right where the A's team was about three years ago, just starting to develop and become stars, and maybe not quite as good now as they're going to be two or three years from now. The Reds have some young stars, too, and they've had three or four veterans that have been through it all. One and two. Fouled again. I think it's interesting, Kurt, that during the championship series against Oakland, Oakland was supposed to be the team that was going to run wild. And on the base pass, anyway, the Red Sox pressured the defense, and the same is happening, although it's early at today. They're running the bases. Zimmer's got them moving, as does Daryl Johnson. The A's did not steal a base against the Red Sox in the three games. One ball, two strikes to Cecil Cooper. Got him on a high, hard one. First strikeout recorded by Don Gullett. And here comes Louis Tion. He's been up only once this year. In fact, he's the only Red Sox pitcher who's been to bat in the last three years. He's not bad. He's had five home runs in his career. He's not a bad, good, uh, he's a good, good first bad ball. hitter or a bad, good hitter. <laughs> Either one. He's a good, uh, fast uh, first ball hitter. He'll surprise you. If Gullet comes in with a fastball on the first pitch, uh, Tion will take a pretty good rip at it. All right, we watch for anything here now. Runners on first and third, one out. <laughs> he took a rip at it all right. He's catch his glove when he did. I didn't like that swing. I didn't like that swing, Tony. What do you watch think? Watch Louie. He lost that swing that he learned many years ago <laughs> down in Cuba. The ball was by him. If he lost a fly ball to the outfield, we're going to see some fun because they've got some pretty good throwing arms in the Cincinnati outfield. They're playing shallow. They're playing very shallow. High. One and one. You might watch for a sacrifice here. Petroselli's at third. Burleson at first. The wind is blowing in from first to third. When this wind comes in, sometimes you don't score a lot of runs at Fenway. It can be a pitcher's ballpark instead of a pitcher's nightmare. One ball, one strike. High fastball. He had his cut. Now what? There's Darrell flashing some signs to Don Zimmer. Even with two strikes, he may switch to keep out of the double play, keep something going, have Tion try and lay one down. He's even, out of the double play. He's even laughing at yeah. Tion. <laughs> one ball, two strikes. Runners on first and third, one out. Struck him out on a curveball. That's two strikeouts, and Gullet is pitching in the clutch when he's had to. He had runners on first and second, one out, pitched out of the first. Runners on first and third, nobody out, and it struck out Cooper and Tion. White Evans coming up. Evans, single to left, his first time. Here's a fellow that I think defensively has already proven it, but not, is not yet, Dick, as good a hitter as he's going to become. No, he didn't start hitting until August of this season. Really was in a slump early. In fact, Bernie Carbo played most of right field until the latter part of the year. All right. Two runners lead away. Two down. He was trying to go to right field with that outside pitch. That's the way to do it. Don't try and pull that fastball of gullets when it's outside. Do you just pop it up or ground it out to the right side? The right fielder today playing shallower for both clubs than he normally would with the wind blowing in from that direction. Foul back. Gullet has him two strikes. Here's a fellow in the great foul ball catcher. So is Fisk in baseball. Either one will have much room to operate today. They'll have a lot more room in Cincinnati. Most foul balls are in the seats here. 0 and 2. And fans can reach right out and touch the ball players at Fenway. Fly ball down the right field line. The wind may keep it playable. It does. And Griffey has it in foul ground to retire the side. No runs. The hit two left at the end of two. No score. Al Tiante will face the talented young Ken Griffey, who beat out 38 infield hits during the year. He's been clocked in 3.5 going to first base. He's developed into quite a ball player. Was born in Stan Musial's hometown of Denora, Pennsylvania. And the infield is in on him. You have to play in 
and unload that ball quickly. Strike. El Tiante has not allowed an earned run in his last 27 innings here at Fenway Park. And that's pitching, my friend, in this little ballpark. Griffey, Geronimo, and Gullet. Change up. Doyle grabs it, throws to first, and got him a good play. Red Sox play. season changed when Denny Doyle joined him in Kansas City in mid-June. The big acquisition. He has been a spark, and it's interesting that on a change of speed pitch, normally a second baseman would be breaking toward first base because he would pull the ball more. But Doyle got an excellent jump. Going his right, he scraps every minute, as does his partner at around second base, Rick Burleson. You know, Tony, he's a winning player that never had a chance to play in a winning team. Finally got his shot. Cesar Geronimo, the batter. He hits a high smash right center. The wind may hold it up. Freddie Lynn's calling for it. Two down. I told Fred Lynn Sunday night, or Saturday night in the parking lot, I said, I broadcast Joe DiMaggio, Dominic DiMaggio, Jim Pearsall, three of the okay, best. Five. You're the most deceptive center Nine fielder five. I've ever seen. He looks like he's not covering any ground. He just glides to the ball. He makes plays look easy. And we'll see two of the best today in Geronimo and in this series, Geronimo and Lynn. Kurt, they talk about pitchers not hitting. Well, the championship series against Pittsburgh, the man coming out of the dugout, Don Gullett, he popped his first major league home run. Dizzy Dean would have loved him. There Larry Dunry, pitcher for Pittsburgh. That was a big hit. That, that made that game easy for Gullet. He has uh, two comparatively good seasons back to back 238 and 226. Any pitcher hits over 200 is doing a good job. Two down, nobody on. The Reds have actually hit the ball harder than the Red Sox, but haven't had a base runner. There's a high fly to Yastrzemski, an easy play in left field. Captain Carl has it. Only four pitches for Tion in that inning. No score, two and a half gone. This is our, our handheld camera peeping out of the scoreboard right behind George Foster. We had some marvelous shots with this Thank camera in the American League playoffs. Well, the story sure. is Tion's retired nine in a row. Some of the balls were hit hard off him, though. While the Red Sox have had two men on in each, the first and second. But then young Don Gullett settled down and got him out. Now it's Doyle. Yastrzemski and Fitz, two left-handers and a right-hander. Well, fouls it out of play. We told you before the game, the wind is so important in any park, but especially at Fenway. And the wind today is coming off the river in from the right field corner toward third base. And it's holding up balls in the center field in the right field. What a curve he's got. Just drops off the end of the table. They call that a strike on him. They appealed to uh, Dick Stallow at third. He said it was a strike. He committed himself. Well, that's the way they have to pitch to Doyle because if you come in with the fastball, he can uh, line a shot down the right field line into the grandstand. He's hit four homers this year. Playing Doyle very shallow in left center. Geronimo he usually plays deep. There's a sharp hit ball to Joe Morgan at second. We have one down for the Red Sox. And after the first two innings, they had their leadoff man on. Doyle goes out. Red Sox. Before they sold all their players to the Yankees, won more world championships than any team in baseball. Then they unloaded fellows like Wade Hoyt, Babe Ruth, a kid named Babe Ruth. They have won five, lost two in World Series competition. They lost to the Cardinals in modern times, 46. Seven games into the Cardinals of 67 in seven games. Two balls, no strikes to Yastrzemski. The rape of the Red Sox, they called it. Carl Mays, they sold him. Harry Frazee, the theatrical man, needed more money for his dramatic shows. Here's the drama right out here. Two balls, one strike to Carl Yastrzemski. Don Gullett from Lynn, Kentucky. All state and everything, including backgammon. It's a hot shot to shortstop Concepcion. And we have two down. Carlton Fisk popped up with two runners on his first time. 
Number 27. I guess, you know, most Tony and Dick, most managers, oh, experts think the four best pitchers in baseball right now are Palmer, Hunter, Seaver, and this youngster out in the mound. Now they're talking about pitchers with still some years left. Tion on a given day can beat anybody as he's already proven. But Gullet is certainly one of the four best pitchers in the game and he's only 24 years old. As far as the Red Sox are concerned, in a way he resembles by the blue. He has that kind of a fastball, but he probably has uh, better breaking stuff than blue. Two down, nobody on. No score. Last to the third. Game one of the series. A slate gray day. We started in a light drizzle here. The rain has stopped. But a dampness permeating Fenway Field. A high foul over toward the Red Sox dugout and out of play. Balls hit toward the right side are being held up by the wind, too. They may drift back into playable territory. See the white haired man down there? He's Boston's favorite, Tip O'Neill, the congressman. There with uh, Treasure Simon and his wife. We'll uh, get into that. Celebrity role later on right now we have a 3 1 count to Carlton Fisk two down Pudge Fisk there's a high drive the left field way up way up but the wind is holding it up and it's caught by Foster and he judged it perfectly you couldn't play it easier than that three up three down at the end of three no score. Here's a rerun of that high blast of Fisk. If the wind was blowing out today, this would have been up on the screen for a home run. Foster gauges it perfectly. Pete Rose. Pete Rose at the head of the red batting order Number leading off. He'll be followed by Joe Morgan and Johnny Bench. Rose grounded out his first time. He hits out of a deep crouch. You always wonder how a fella sees the ball. Sometimes they see it better out of a crouch, don't they, Tony? Yeah. Better if there's a little bit of a glare, which there is not today, and I think the hitters are grateful for that. Sharp ground ball to Denny Doyle. The Reds are stinging the ball, but right at somebody. And now Tion has retired the first 10 batters. Joe Morgan lined out the second his first time. When Tion returned from his back problems uh, late August, early September, his first start was against the Tigers. He had a no-hitter going into the eighth inning. Aurelio Rodriguez broke it up with a single. Joe didn't hit like he can in that championship series. He wound up fourth in batting in the National League this year. There's a change of the strike. He put his name on it, his street address, and his telephone number. Here's that little dipsy doodle. Slow curveball. Morgan, an excellent fastball hitter. Morgan lines the first hit for the Reds in the center field. And he's the first base runner. Now the drama starts. And Joe Morgan run on Carlton Fisk. Tion, does he balk? Some say he does, some say he doesn't. What to watch for? He'll wiggle his hand and ball down, the glove and the ball down. If he stops, he has to pitch out of that stop position. And he just can't flip the ball to first base. He has to make a move with his free foot or his left foot to first or to box. So you have one of the great base runners of modern times on first. He stole 67 bases this year out of 77 attempts. Oh, Lordy, that's some record. He will get a big lead early. He wants to draw throws from Tion. He wants to see all of his moves to home plate and the first base. Tion has a bundle of them, just like Bill Lee tomorrow will have. The Reds were successful in over 80% of their steals. Morgan's a great teacher to his teammates, too. He works with them. Videotape machine. Foul ball by Johnny Bench. You play differently in this park, even the opponents, so You don't run yourself out of innings there because a high fly can win it for you or be up in the screen. But today, the wind is holding balls up to the outfield. The wind is going to be very important. Bench. Fly to right his first time. Morgan at first. One strike. Dion drives him back. That's exactly what Joe wants. He wants to see every move as early as he can, and he relay the information to Concepcion, to Griffey, to Foster. He's got a big lead. 
No score, fourth inning. Oh, a little closer. That's all right. Morgan likes it that way. He wants to measure him, measure him off. Right now, he's taking what they call the base stealers, the one-way lead, a little bit longer than normal. He's leaning a little bit back toward first base. He wants to draw a throw. Park fans, they had him in Cincinnati. They wouldn't be saying a word. <laughs> oh, Joe might have been gone. Let's look at it again. Watch this. Watch Morgan just lean towards second base. He got the feet crossed up, which doesn't happen often with Joe. What do you think, Tony? I'll tell you. He had the hand in, and Cooper's been able to tag that hand instead of up on the elbow. Yeah, I think. I think he had his hand back. I'll tell you what, if the throw had been more toward the first base side, he would definitely would have been out. Cooper had to move his hand over to make that tag. It's a pretty good duel right here. This is a real duel going on, a real gunfighter duel now here. Tiant and Morgan. We forgot all about Ben. She's the batter. Oh, Bach. Bach. Oh. Bach. Morgan yelled immediately when he threw. Now here's Darrell here Johnson Darryl. coming out to argue with the National League umpire who called the Bach. Now, one of the ways they will call a ball on Tiant is if he throws to first base and then step. The rule says you must step toward first base and then throw. And this Tion was a has controversy, Tony, before the series. The Reds claimed he bucked. And they got a National League umpire who called it at first. I'll say this, Kurt and Dick. The National League umpires during the course of the year have called this ball on National League pitchers all year long. Watch Tion. Does he throw and then step? That is the key. There is the ball. And it's splitting some pretty fine hairs, and it's difficult to see. We'll see Tiant all by himself. Watch his leg. Watch his left foot. Does he step first and then throw, or does he throw and then step? That's the key for you fans. I'll tell you, it looked like a legitimate move to me. Did me too. He's got one that's worse than that when he does, Buck, but that was a legitimate move, I think. Boy, he's mad. He's glaring at Nick Colosi over at first base. Well, it's the National League umpire sort of on the spot here with Tiot. Really, they were put on the spot before the series started. Here's the way this guy's pitched all his career, and you can't expect him to change. On the other hand, the umpires are used to one thing. Morgan's up second on a balk, one out. Johnny Bench the batter. One strike to him. Bench fouls the back, it's 0 and 2. Nothing and 2. It did not look, well, I think you all judge it yourself, that he took a step toward home plate took that legitimate step toward first. Well, he wasn't called for a balk all of 75, and he claimed... Boy, the Red Sox are giving it to Colosi. Colosi now is pointing in. See. And Daryl Johnson, they're on him now. They're really on him, out of the Red Sox dugout. Umpires will be much more patient in the course of a World Series. That's they're Bernie Carbo. The office Bernie Carbo used to play in the National League. They've got the explosion starting already here. Tion's the central figure. There's a high fly. That'll be blown into the seats down the left field line. Tion's mad. His manager's mad. And the Red Sox squad's mad. And while they all cool off, we'll pause for station identification. This is the NBC television network. Kurt Gowdy, Dick Stockton, Tony Kubek. Louis Tion has bought Joe Morgan a second. The Red Sox fans and team are on the National League umpire at first, Nick Delosi. Meantime, the count to Johnny Bench is two strikes. There's no score in the fourth inning with one out. Watch Morgan. He can go to third. Deion knows it. Doyle trying to keep him close. Outside, a ball and two strikes. Kurt, I think we, what we've seen so far in this controversy, and it's a pretty good testimony that just possibly Umpiring should be under one jurisdiction, maybe the commissioner's up. So they umpire the same way in both leagues. Same strike zone, same ball calls, same interpretation well, of the rules. You don't understand how the World Series is played under different sets of rules in the regular season. American League uses the designated hitter, the National League does. I'm not I'm just reporting facts, and yet in the World Series, they play the National League rules. Also, the position of umpires on second base calls, uh, and also the chest protector being worn inside and out. So there are differences. There's no question about it. Two balls, two strikes to Johnny Bench. Bench played as a pull hitter to left field. 
and back deep. I, I can't imagine the box disturbing Tiant that much. He just has too much savvy and know how to get upset. He's been around so much. Yesterday after practice, I said, look, uh, how do you feel about it? And just in case the controversy comes up, he says, no, I, it doesn't bother me. He says, I expect it. If it happens, I'll just go along and pitch. Bothered him for a little while. <laughs> he walked <laughs> over and said something to Colosi. <laughs> Three and two. Johnny Bench, he had a two-strike count. Now he's leveled it off. Bench chopping away at a low fastball. Kurt, I'll say one thing. I don't know if you can ever call an umpire's decision courageous, but if there ever was one to call a ball count, Louis D. on yeah. Fenway Park. I'll <laughs> give him credit for that. I will, too. For well, these kind of fans they have here in Boston, it's, this isn't the Boston Red Sox. It's really the New England Red Sox. The whole area has adopted them and has for years. There's Daryl Johnson. Joe Morgan, single after one out, the first hit, the first base runner, and then went to second on a buck. Called on Louis Tion. 3 2 delivery. Bench pops it foul into the seats and back of first base. Sparky Anderson, just watching the ball game right now. 41 years old. We kid him. Call him the Silver Fox. What kind of silver rinse he's using. Very attractive man. He's personable. He's enthusiastic. Yet he keeps a stern hand. Demands. No mustaches, no long hair with his players, ties, jackets. The whole Red organization is a very disciplined outfit. Doyle is going to shade bench anyway, so now the fans give it the old mock mock call. You see an experienced pitcher. A lot of young pitchers might have gone right ahead to home plate with Doyle out of position. Tia just very calmly stepped back. 3-2 pitch to Johnny Bench coming up again. Foul ball, he lost his bat. Uh, there's a play right there that we want to uh, uh, warn you National League fans about. And it's a play that Concepcion, I know, has been warned about. When a, when a ball goes by third fair, and we've talked about this all during the years on the game of the week, and hits that jutting out portion of the stands, the shortstop must feel that ball, not the left fielder, which is just another one of the tricks of this ballpark. That was foul all the way. That last one. Three two to Johnny Bench. Morgan is second, one out. No score, fourth inning. Again a foul ball. Bench had his problems in the championship series. He struck out a lot, and this is no excuse for Johnny, but he was in a collision at home plate earlier in the year. He injured his left shoulder. He has not been able to get the bat out almost all season long on fastballs high and tight. And ordinarily, Johnny is an inside hitter. He likes to pull the ball, likes the ball in a little bit. One out. Morgan is second. 3-2 count to Johnny Bench. Tony Perez on deck. The Reds hitting in the fourth. 108 wins this year. A sweep of the playoffs. One of the great teams of modern times. They have an eight game winning streak coming into the opening game of the World Series. And he fouls it again. Boy, he's making Tiant work. After Tiant threw only four pitches to get him out in the third, Perez, classy veteran, real gentleman. Also a Cuban, as is Tion. We must have about 50 major leaguers stocked up over there right now. They can really play ball, and they love it. Three and two. Just a piece of it. This is about the same thing that happened to the Oakland A's against Tion. They thought they were on his fastball, but they were just missing it, just behind it, popping the ball to center field. Let's look at Bench's swing again. A little bit behind it. Pitch was right, right in the heart of the play, Tony. It surprised you. With all the different motions, the fastball is on you quicker than you think. Joe Morgan getting his lead at second. One out. No score. Three and two to Johnny Bench. There goes Morgan. And it's popped up. Carlton Fisk. We'll have a play on this one. The wind helped him. Kept it out of the box seat. 
Morgan had a tremendous jump on Theon. Line drive at somebody. We'd had a double play. You know, everybody all week long have been asking Carlton Fisk about the Cincinnati runners. He says, you know, you can judge a catcher by other things besides his throw to second, how he calls a game, how he sets up, how he handles pop-ups. And uh, Fisk, all he has heard in the playoffs and here in the World Series, Oakland's running, Cincinnati's running. I think today we're watching the two best catchers in baseball. I mean, for their ages, what they can do with a bat, throwing. Munson's not bad. Munson's a great player. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, you always get on Munson. I think he's one of the best and a tremendous competitor. I think another thing that Fist does well, Dick, and you, you've you talked about a lot in your local telecast, he blocks pitches well, which is important against a team like Cincinnati to keep him that, that one base. Perez flat out his first time. No score in a fourth. Change up is high to Perez, that big floater. George Foster on deck. Took 13 pitches to get Johnny Bench out as Foster now is watching Tian. Trying to study all those wiggles and waggles. It's interesting too, Kurt, that the first inning Tian threw a lot of pitches. He had an easy inning. He's throwing a lot of pitches this inning. See if he stiffens up with that back in this cool weather. Let's see if this one is out of play. It's coming back toward the netting. One ball, one strike to Perez. Perez became the all-time Cincinnati RBI leader on September 2nd, passing quite a ball player and hitter Frank Robinson. He has now driven in 1,024 runs in a red uniform. One ball, one strike. Morgan at second, two outs. The Reds nothing, the Red Sox nothing. Right by him up the ladder, he had him just climbing up. A ball and two strikes to Perez. Tony used to be a third baseman. They moved him to first. They say they're going to move Bench to first or left field later on to prolong his career. They have a good young catcher named Werner. Louie, Louie. Fans start chanting. One ball, two strikes. They got him. No run. One hit, one left. At the end of three and a half, no score. Well, we've had no score, but we've had plenty of excitement. Johnny Pence just threw the ball into center field. Don Gullett will face Fred Lynn, Rico Petroselli, Rick Burleson. Frank Where's Robinson, Frank? we were talking about him. He's been rehired as the here. Cleveland manager. Fred Lynn. And they say he did a fine job well. with the Indians. Lynn. Had an infield hit his first time up. Questionable one. High and outside, bluff to bunt, ball one. Out of the University of Southern California, he was not drafted until the second round his senior year. They let him go by all those ball clubs the first round. So the scouts are not letter perfect. They got some bad reports, surprisingly enough. They said he couldn't hit left-handed pitching, that he'd want too much money. Uh, there were a lot of negative reports about Fred Lynn, and that's why he lasted that long. And the Red Sox are glad he lasted, and... Count now to him, one ball, two strikes. Said he's used to playing on winning teams, except for Pawtucket in the minor league. He hits a foul back toward our way. One ball, two strikes to Fred Lamb. He does everything. Hits, hits with power, runs, throws, and was just born to play Major League Baseball. Has the instinct to make the right play. Really had four homers in one game this year. He had three homers, a triple that missed a home run by Hot Bar, Dick. By about two feet off the left yeah. field fence in Detroit. In fact, that was the game that really projected him into the national uh, picture. Ten RBIs in that game. 16 All total three. bases, three yeah. home runs. Imagine a rookie hitting four homers in a game. He had three and just missed the fourth one by a couple of feet. Nobody on, nobody out. Three and two to Fred Lynn. 
Don Gullen. Glenn pops it up. Concepcion waiting for it. One down. Kurt with the kind of fastball that Gullet has, he likes to pitch that fastball high in the strike zone. He's a little bit of an advantage today because there's an American League umpire behind old plate. You'll get some of those high pitches, which can be important to him, especially in this park. Rico Petroselli walked his first time up. I don't know. You hear that about uh, give you the low strike of the national high strike for America. And there's a drive in the deep center. Geronimo drawing the beat on it. Two down. Again, the wind held the ball up. Two up, two down. Rick Burleson coming up. I remember when all those great sluggers came into Boston in the 60s for the All Star game. They went into extra innings and played a one to one tie. Nobody could hit the fence. The wind was coming in. Burleson, single to left his first time. Some people think this is a better park for a left handed hitter. I think it's a left handed hitting ballpark. Always have. Saw William Gestrensky, Goodman good Runnels Reynolds with batting championships here. They're all left-handed. Used to see Wirtz, Doby, Kubek, Mantle when he switch hit. Thanks, pal. You did. You hit well here. Now, what about you were a left-handed hitter? Did you like to hit here? Yes, I think most left-handers will tell you they do. You've got a spacious part of the park. It, it hurts a home run hitter a lot, but the line drive hitter, it helps. Plus, they give you pitches inside you can handle. Right-handed hitters, it'll help some, but it has hurt as many as it has helped because they've tried to pull the ball too much. Hi, ball. One and one. Let's get a shot behind home plate. The background is what the hitters like. The white ball comes out of the green wall. Great background. There's a base hit by Burleson in the right field. That's his second hit in a row. And all the hitters love the background here. Because that wall is so high in front of the center field bleachers that the crowd doesn't bother. Now there's that green wall, and that ball really looks big when it comes in. You may not hit it, but it looks pretty good to you. A lot of fly balls go out for home runs, but then a lot of line drives that normally would be homers go off the walls for singles or doubles here. Red Sox have four hits. The Reds have one hit. Two down. Burleson at first. Cooper up. Struck out his first time. Fouls it back. 0-1 to Cecil Cooper. Yeah, he got going the last half of the year. They're playing him to the opposite field. They have a book on each team. There goes the runner. Benches throw right on the button. Don't run on him. Burleson's an easy out. Johnny Bench to Concepcion. No runs, one hit, nobody left at the end of four. It's nothing, nothing. Preceding announcement was furnished in the public service by Major League Baseball. Watch out calmly. Johnny Bench gets rid of the ball at second base, knowing he has Burleson all the way. Gullet does not have a good move to first base, but he's very quick going home, and he's tough to steal on. And the Red Sox keep running. They're trying to pressure the defense, which is so good of the Cincinnati Reds. Johnny Bench is a one-handed catcher. Rod Hundley started in the modern times. That is a... He catches the ball one-handed with a mitt so he won't damage his throwing hand. And he gets that ball out of that mitt very quickly. Foster lying the first base his first time. This is the fifth inning. No runs, four hits for the Red Sox. No runs, one hit for the Red. There's a drive to left. His friends will have to cut it off. He does, and he holds him to a single. That's his kind of play out there. Very important in this park. Do not let that ball get into the corner and uh, get a double. Now you got a double play set up. Kurt and Dick, aside from playing that wall so well, Yastrzemski can play a very shallow left field, and he'll catch a lot of line drives. He'll throw him in out second base or trying to score from second. He may have slowed down a step as far as speed, but his quickness is still there. Foster's hit the ball hard twice now. Line drive out and a single. Concepcion has flied to left his first time. They're playing him to pull a step or two to left. Petroselli in tight at third. Page up. Well, that's an overhand slow ball. There's Rico in. Concepcion's a good bunner. He does everything well. Concepcion hit 340 in the month of September, and he's hit safely in his last 12 games of the season. Foster at first. He stole only two bases this year. He didn't run much. Side arm curve. He, that's his slow curve. 
No balls, two strikes. Kurt, I wish we could have gotten in the uh, Cincinnati dugout to listen to how Joe Morgan, I'm sure, passed the information along on the Tiant moves to some of the other base runners and base dealers for Cincinnati. Would have been interesting. He works continually with his Griffey and Concepcion, the other young players, with speed. Sort of a base stealing coach of the player. One ball, two strikes. The Red Sox had gullet and trouble the first two innings. He settled down since. The first uh, ten men went out for the Reds, and Morgan single was Bach the second. He's been their lone base runner until this inning when Foster led off the inning with a single. One ball, two strikes to Concepcion. Ken Griffey's on deck. He'll be a left-handed batter. You notice those on deck men, how intently they're studying the eye. Trying to figure out all those jerks, head movements, body movements. Nobody has yet. I don't think Tion even knows what he's going to do when he starts getting up at the top of his motion. I think he decides what he's going to pitch when he comes down, right before he throws the ball. And I think that makes it easier for him, because otherwise I think he wouldn't be able to do all those things if he knows he's going to come in with a certain kind of a pitch. Two and two to Concepcion. Foster at first, nobody out. Fifth inning. Wiggle waggle, now stop. That is a second strikeout for Tion. He will throw you so many pitches. You can bat against Louis Tion as we watch him again right. three times in the game and never see the same pitch and same delivery twice. Right. This appeared to be a harder. Right. Well, it's something sinking. Right. Came a little bit more from the side. He's a 35-year-old marvel, he says. He doesn't say he's a marvel. He says he's 35. I like to bet on that, Vic. Nobody knows where his birth certificate is, Kurt. Well, I couldn't find Satchel Pages. They haven't found this man yet. Griffey trying to punch that outside pitch to left field. Strike one to Ken Griffey, who grounded out his first time. This is a tough part of the Cincinnati lineup. I don't know who else can send up. Well, there might be a couple of other teams send Griffey and Geronimo up with Concepcion, the latter part of their lineup, with the speed and power they have. You just said something very important. Number uh, seven and eight hitters, it's important to keep them off the bases. And they're good ones because then you have the top of the order coming up. Rose and Morgan after the pitcher. That's right, down to number eight. What a lineup. How many teams have it? Oh, and two. That was just a fastball that time. Well, once a game, I come up with a gem. <laughs> Maybe. That's the first, <laughs> your first gem of the season. I was t t talking about Louis Tion's father. When he pitched to the Negro American League, he said he had a tough time here in America. He didn't want his son to go through the prejudice that uh, he had gone through. He tried to discourage him. There's a high fly ball. Let's see. That ball is going to be foul. That's Davidson of the National League going down the line of sale foul. So I said to Tion, he has a little boy. I said, uh, do you want your boy to major be a major league baseball pitcher? He says, no. I said, he wants to be a hockey player. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a lot of rinks around here, summer and winter alike. The youngsters, they love their hockey up here. No balls, two strikes. The Ken Griffey, one out. That's Foster at first. We have no score in this game in the top of the fifth inning. Ken Griffey batting number seven. Geronimo, a left-hander's on deck. Check swing. Hit to Petroselli. Fast man. He has him. Two down. Foster moves to second. You're not forced too many mistakes against the Red Sox either. They've been steady. And watch Petroselli. He knows even though Griffey has great speed out of the box, he has time because he did not get a good jump on the check swing and very calmly threw him out easily. Rico's going to retire every year. I think they're talking about 
Well, they want to put Geronimo on and go against Gullet. I would think they would. First, they're talking over right now. Listen, if you think you can get him out or get him to go after a bad pitch, hit the ball weakly, you've got your pitcher leading off next inning. But that first base open, a left-hander up, the percentages anyway right now would be to put him on. The A's did not do that against the Red Sox a couple of times. Alvin Dark took a shot, and he, he probably had good reasons for it. Neither did Daryl Johnson. He pitched to Reggie Jackson with first base open. Reggie Jackson did a home run. Pitched to Claudel Washington the next game with first base open. He drove home a run. And they're going to walk Geronimo and pitch to a better than average hitting pitcher, Don Gullett. Not surprising. Daryl Johnson has really played the percentages all season long. That's uh, Louis' boy, isn't it? Yep. Louis Tian's son. Is he a Luis also, Dick? Yes. His father was one of the great pitchers in the history of Cuba. Great emotional moment when uh, the Tian family arrived at uh, Logan Airport in Boston. Louis uh, just broke down, as you might imagine, all the photographers and Newsreel Cameron were out there to record it. And uh, he's an emotional guy, Louis Tion. Well, he's a grand fella. Everybody likes him. Very witty. Fun, fun fellow to be around. around. And Dick, his father has seen him pitch Fella. some ball games, some of the greatest of his career, Fella. under the most intense pressure he's ever been on, under fighting for the championship. All right, Don Gullett has a chance to help himself. He fly to left his first time. We have Foster at second, Geronimo at first, two down. No score, fifth inning. That wind is still blowing in from first to third. It's had an effect on the pitching and hitting of this game. Strike to Gullet. Stiff wind. Hasn't let down a bit. Tomorrow, surprise, Lee will pitch for the Red Sox. He's had a bad elbow the last month. And Billingham will go for the Reds. Game two, same time. Pops it up. Fisk gives way to Petroselli. The side is out. No runs, a hit, two left. We're halfway through in a score. Nothing, nothing. Well, to use the old baseball cliche, good pitching will stop good hitting. That's what's happened so far with Gullet and Teon mastering the hitters. Now it's my pleasure to turn the play-by-play -play mic over to Dick Stockton. This was his first year of telecasting with the Red Sox. He had a memorable season and he made it very pleasurable for the fans of New England. Dick, welcome to NBC. Thank you, Kurt. Good luck. Thank, Thank you, you, Tony. Cecil Cooper will lead off. He was at the bat uh, when Rick Burleson was uh, thrown out stealing in the fourth inning. Cooper struck out his first time up on a high fastball from Don Gullett. Scoreless game. They expected a lot of runs to be scored here, a lot of home runs. But through the first four and a half innings, nothing, nothing to score. Fouls off a slow curve. Cooper, a good fastball hitter, as uh, Tony mentioned, likes to hit line drives to all parts of the ballpark. He will probably pull the ball a little bit more against a right-handed pitcher. Left-handers, Geronimo shading him slightly toward left center. They give him the gap in left center field. The count is a ball and two strikes to Cooper. There you see the outfield alignment. I haven't seen many teams in the American League play Cooper that far down the left field line. They play him like a right-handed pull hitter. Swings and misses, and that's the way to pitch to Cooper outside. He got him with the fastball, so Cooper goes down for the second time on strikeout. Gullet's third strikeout of the game. A hand for Luis Tion, who has uh, pitched out of a couple of jams the last two innings, and there is the Tion family. What is he swinging around up there, Dick? Oh, that's a, a <laughs> loud horn that uh, Maria Tion, Louis' wife, had when the Red Sox wrapped up the American League pennant in Oakland. And she was heard all over that airport in Oakland. <laughs> Ball one to him. As Kurt mentioned, Tion came to the plate one time this year. One ball and a stride. I don't think he's getting his swings in. 
two and one. All of the Red Sox pitchers look forward to taking batting practice for this World Series. You know how pitchers are when it comes to hitting. And uh, they couldn't wait when they put up that batting cage for Rick Wise and Dick Drago, Cleveland, and also Louie to take their swings. Swings and misses, foul tip into the mid of Johnny Bench, and it's two and two. Rick Waits, the only left-hander to beat the Red Sox at Fenway Park this year in a starting role. And a cheer for Tiani got a piece of it, fouls it back. The kind of left-handers that usually have success, as far as I recall, against the Red Sox are the guys who throw the little curveball, the change of speeds, a little screwball, a Freddie Norman type. Spot pitchers. Another foul back by Tiani. In fact, breaking ball pitchers who threw to spots caused problems for the Red Sox all year. They had no problem with the likes of a Vida Blue or a Nolan Ryan or a Bert Blylevin. Ed Figueroa, for example, beat him three times. I think that's true of both ball clubs in this World Series. If you can get a guy who gets his breaking stuff and changes speed stuff over, it can't be beaten. Well, Gullick's proven otherwise right now. He's throwing the ball hard. The 2-2 pitch gets away from bench in a full count. So Gullick has to work a little bit harder with Tion than he probably expected, and the count is full. Last of the fifth inning, no score. The Reds have two hits. The Red Sox have four. Well played game defensively. And that's something we also anticipated. And Tion walks. Well, Gullet walks Louis Tion with one out in the fifth inning to the delight of the fans here at Fenway. There's nothing Tion can do that is wrong to the Boston fans. That's the first time in how many years that Tion has been on base. <laughs> I wonder if Johnny Pesky, the first base coach, said that way is second base. There's that this thing. Uh, you know what they're talking about. Right? The ball called on Louis. Nick Colosi talking to him. Look at that. Louis talking about his shoulder. Did he step? Did he jump? Well, Colosi wanted to make an explanation there, and uh, Louis had a chance to get his side in. Here's Dwight Evans. Single to start the first inning for the Red Sox and then fouled out to the right fielder, Ken Griffey. Pesky just went over to Tion and Louis. This is first base, remember? <laughs> that is second. Yeah. Fastball is high. You got to give uh, Evans off speed pitches, and if you make a mistake, he'll take you deep. Another fastball high, and it's 2 0. Oh. Gullet keeps looking down in front of the mound. You wonder if he's having trouble with the mound. Now Larry Shepard, the pitching coach, is coming out. Sometimes the pitchers, in this case Gullet and Tion, have different lengths of strides. When that front foot hits, they dig a different hole, and Gullet may be landing on the down slope or up slope. We don't know which. Maybe causing him some control problems as the hole gets deeper. Also, let's remember, Tony, that we had a light rain at the start of the game. Might be a little slippery for him as he puts leverage coming down. He is a youngster, but he has been in postseason play before, and he's done well. There's a look at uh, Don Gullett's feet, and of course, uh, some mounds are different than others. I know uh, the Red Sox pitchers had problems in uh, Milwaukee this year. The mound was a little lower. We have activity in the Cincinnati bullpen. Evans takes ball three. So Sparky Anderson has someone up. In the Reds' bullpen, it's Pat Darcy, a rookie right-hander who had a very successful first year for the Reds. They don't waste any time going to that bullpen either. They've got a great bullpen. There's a strike. Evans was taking all the way. Unusual man to have up. You usually think of the East Twix, the Macanades, the Barbones, or Clay Carroll, and he's got a man who hasn't been a key man in his bullpen. Now more action. A left-hander gets up, and it's popped up to short right field. Joe Morgan waving everybody off. He makes the catch for out number two. Red Sox didn't make any mistakes against the A's. The Red Sox, or the Reds made very few mistakes all year. They led the National Five. League in fielding. And they set a record in the consecutive games without an error. They went 15 games in a row in a regular season without Doyle. an error. Denny Doyle, and you can see he was a red hot hitter in the last few games of the season when the pressure was really on the Red Sox shoulders. Doyle sacrificed his first time up and then bounced to Joe Morgan at second. Wheels a good bat, can go to left, sometimes serves base hits to left and right center field. 
And there's a blooper in the right field for a base hit. Holding it second is Tion. And the Red Sox have their fifth hit off Don Miller. That's what we mean by Denny Doyle's ability to serve a ball out to a short left to right center. And the hand for Carl Yastrzemski. Pat Darcy is the right-hander, and the left-hander working with him in the bullpen is Freddie Norman. He was upset that he was bypassed in game number two, but Sparky Anderson says, Norman will be my middle-inning left-handed reliever to face the likes of Yastrzemski and Lynn. Tion is on at second. Doyle at first, two down, no score. Bouncing ball handled by Perez, and that will end it in the fifth inning. So the Red Sox get a hit and leave two. We've completed five with the score. The Reds nothing, and the Red Sox nothing. Back at Fenway Park, this is Dick Stockton with Kurt Gowdy and Tony Kubek. We've completed five innings of a scoreless game in the first contest of the 1975 World Series. In the top of the order, we'll lead it off for the Reds in the sixth inning. Pete Rose, twice this afternoon, has bounced to Denny Doyle. Well, we have not had uh, a run scored in this game. We have uh, not had anything resembling a close to a home run, except perhaps Carlton Fisk uh, drive to left center field. That was hauled down by Foster. And we had the eruption of that controversy concerning the bar. And Rose times it, and Dwight Evans comes in to make the catch. Dwight Evans can do it all in right field. Can cover the line, can come in and go to right center as well. Call sinking fast. He has a lot of ground to cover. Fortunately, today, a cloudy day, the right fielders do not have to battle the sun. That kid right now plays his position as well as anybody in baseball, Dwight Evans. And a superb throwing arm as well. One out in the sixth inning. Here's Joe Morgan. He got the first Reds hit, a single with one out in the fourth inning. And then advanced to second when Nick Colosi called the balk on Louis Tian. Misses outside. So far, Rose and Morgan have been up five times. Morgan's reached base once. That's been it. On the corner, Tion, who uh, his control might have been a bit shaky in the first couple of innings, has really come on in that department in the last three innings. He has walked one. That was an intentional walk. Has struck out two. So curve. You saw the umpire, Art France, give it a second look. And it's two and one. He'll throw that one to left-handed hitters where he starts at a foot outside and it comes over the outside corner of the plate. You give up on it. This is with the fastball. And Morgan was ready to argue with France. Three and one the count. I think uh, with Joe Morgan here that on the mound is the key of the series for the Red Sox. Tion. He gets them off to a good start. They're the underdogs. They've got a great shot. If he loses, they could be bad trouble. That's, That's a fair ball down the right field line, and Evans will have no play at second. And going Whoa. in is uh, Joe Morgan. And, uh, he almost did have a play indeed. When Morgan began to break his speed between first and second, Evans rifling a strike. That's a tricky spot that you mentioned earlier in the telecast, Dick. You almost got to protect. The deep part, not rush up too soon to play the ball off the wall, or you can get beat by an inside the park home run or triple. And that's the first extra base hit in this ball game. A one out double by Joe Morgan, who's two for three. We'll watch Morgan again. He tried to steal third in the fourth inning on Tion. Had a big lead. Bench fouled out. Let's watch him now. He might try to get over there to third with one out and have Bench get him in with a fly ball. Both sides looking for that one break to get that one run across. Bench is 0 for 2. Third baseman Petroselli holds Morgan at second. Bench is out. Well, Johnny Bench last time up fouled off about a dozen before fouling out. Here he goes after the first pitch and grounds to Rico. Dick and Kurt, we saw what Pelosi called a balk not stepping to first early. Another way they say that Tiant balks, we should watch him with Morgan on second, is the way he jiggles his glove on down. They say he stops twice. Two down, Morgan is at second, and the batter is Tony Perez. 
Red Sox scouts say Perez and Morgan may be the toughest outs in the Cincinnati lineup. He took a cold third strike his last time up. We're watching there. He stops. Gets him on that sidearm changer for a strike. Sometimes he will go to the stop position we just saw just above the belt and then go down another three, four, five inches. Choose one second or momentary stops. Evans plays Perez in right center. Two out, Morgan at second. And Perez fouls it out of play. Not as much of a fastball hitter as some of the other Cincinnati players. And he has the ability to wait at the plate for his pitch. You get the fastball up and away with not much on it. He can a long way to right center field or dead center. Here's where Teon likes to have you now. Two strikes and then play around with you. And if you're an ambitious swinger, he'll give you that slow stuff outside and make you look foolish. Not too many people make Tony Perez look foolish, however. No balls, two strikes. And this is fouled out of play to the right side. Count remains 0-2. Came in there with a pretty good pitch. That was dangerous. He's throwing hard. He's one of these guys who can confound scouting reports against the A's the first ball game a week ago. He started the ball game off with good hard fastballs. Middle innings, he went to off-speed stuff, then came back with a fastball. This ball game against the Reds, he started off with slow stuff. Middle innings, he's going to fastballs, just the opposite. I think, uh, as we mentioned earlier, if Louis doesn't have it, you know it early. And if he does have it, he gets stronger and really smells it as the game goes on. Two strikes to count to Tony Perez. Morgan is at second with two out. And he pulls it on that slow outside curve. And Perez goes down for the second time. Third strikeout for Louis Tion. We go to the bottom of the sixth, no score. Huge day in sports for it on NBC tomorrow, 12.30. You'll see the baseball world of Joe Garagiola preceding the game two of the World Series in Fenway. Followed at 4 o'clock by the Oakland Raiders, the Kansas City Chiefs. I've seen those two clubs over the years. That's one of the bitterest rivalry in football. I don't care what the seasonal records are. It doesn't mean a thing. Oakland's won 15 times. Kansas City 13 times. There have been two ties. The Raiders are favored tomorrow, but look out. NBC Sports. Number one in live action the year round. And a snow score. Last of the sixth inning. And here we are back to Dick Stockton. All right, Kurt. Carlton Fisk. The cleanup hitter for the Red Sox popped to second and fly to left. The wind uh, prevented his uh, last shot to left from going into the net. It was caught by Foster. And that's the only chance that George Foster has had in left field. No score. Bottom of the sixth inning. Don Gullett. One hopper to Concepcion. Fisk is retired. One out. Gullett's made big pitches today. He starts getting himself in trouble. And he comes right back. He's had the tough hitters, got him out. Marvelous young left-hander. Only one starting left-hander, one here in this park this year against the Red Sox. He had the chance today. And Rick Waits was not a fastball pitcher, more of a slider pitcher against the left-handed batters. Ball won the count to Lynn. He's one for two. Had an infield hit in the first inning on the play in which Evans was thrown out Concepcion to bench. Takes a fastball 2-0. Gullett does not have an ordinary fastball as you're seeing today. He has a sensational fastball, and he's usually right with it. It darts all over the strike zone, and he can spot it when he gets ahead. You see the background. Lean bounces a single up the middle. His second hit of the day and the sixth hit off Don Gullett. That's what we meant about the background. You see that white ball coming off that center field wall. The batter gets a good look at the ball. Only one inning, the Red Sox did not have a base runner. That was the third. Here's Rico Petroselli, walked and fly to center. Dick, how about those scouts that said Lynn Bale out against left-handers? Uh, they were wrong. <laughs> That's another one of the advantages of being a left-hander in Fenway. You don't see too many left-handed pitchers. You see right-handers. And there's a hit to right field. Lynn will go to third, and here is Griffey in the corner. He makes the play, going to second with a double is Petroselli. The Red Sox have runners at second and third and one out. Rico went with the pitch to the right field corner. 
And he got some big hits for you late in the season, Dick, and he went that way quite a bit more. He used to be strictly an uppercutter pull hitter going for that left field wall. He's changed. Had a Fenway swing, but he's altered it somewhat. And uh, here is Petroselli, and what a job he has done in September after coming back from inner ear problems. That is what you might consider a perfect pitch. Low and on the outside corner, Rico could hit it no other way. See if they walk him to get to the left-hander or the pitcher. That would be the percentages. Now they have to bring the infield in. And they're going to put Burleson on and pitch to Cooper, who has struck out twice today. Cooper is a battler before the uh, game in the batting cage. People were talking about who the likely hero could be as you look at the Cincinnati bullpen, Clay Carroll, a right-hander. And Cooper says, pointed to first base, he says, number 17, watch him. So even though he hasn't been in postseason play and has not had that much action, he is a confident, assured fellow today. Dick, I think an interesting comment was made by your broadcast partner during the year, the Hawk, Ken Harrelson, when he said... He hasn't seen anybody who could throw fastballs consistently by the Red Sox. He said the first time or two times around, all right, but they eventually catch up to you. And you better start going off-speed stuff. The bases are loaded. Lynn is at third, Petroselli at second, and Burleson at first, one out. The Red Sox had Petroselli at third in the second inning, and Gullet pitched out of that. So here's Cooper with one out and the bases loaded. Rose is on the grass at third, and Perez on the edge of the grass at first. Swings and misses on a high fastball. That's the pitch. Gullet got Cooper back in the second inning. Crowd is turned on here at Fenway Park. They drew over a million seven hundred thousand, as Kurt mentioned at the outset, in a small ballpark. Takes low. Fred Lynn at third. They had a ratio of sellouts that was incredible, wasn't it, the last part of the year? They had crowds of 32,000 or more for about uh, seven or eight games, I think. They got pen and fever early here. And there's a fly ball to center field. Getting a late start is Geronimo. He makes the catch. And here comes Lynn. Here comes the throw, and Lynn is out at home. Well, he challenged one of the great throwing arms in baseball, Cesar Geronimo. Here's Geronimo from our center field camera. He has a great throwing arm, but figuring with Tiant coming next, the pitcher, Zimmer, sends him. They played this aggressively all year long. Ball hit the side of the mound and fortunately bounced back to bench. Johnny Bench makes a good play because this is like a shortstop playing uh, two hopper. He might have the best throwing arm in baseball. He did not get much on that ball, though, oddly enough. A two hopper. Right. So two Red Sox players have been thrown out at the plate, and we go to the seventh of a scoreless game. Remember the World Series games from Cincinnati will be night games Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, starting at 8 o'clock with a baseball world of Joe Garagiola when the series moves to Cincinnati for game three Tuesday night. The old man and the kid, two master pitchers going against each other, spinning shutout innings, the seventh inning in Dick Stockton. George Foster has hit the ball hard twice, takes a breaking ball for a strike, lined out to Cecil Cooper, had him leap to make the catch, and then he lashed a single to left field. One for two is Foster, leading off in the seventh inning. The Reds have three hits off Louis Tion. Another curveball is outside. I think he's hit the ball harder than anybody today, Foster. Once to the right side and the other time to left field and Yastrzemski came over to cut the ball off. Well watch where Carlton Fisk sets up. Sets up toward the uh, middle of the play. One and two. Fisk indicates a lot of times with his after he gets assigned with his chest protectors hand to where what area in the strikes when he wants the pitch? Let's see if he goes to that protect. Looks like he wants it inside. He's setting up outside. Not surprising the way they're pitching Foster, a dead pull hitter, hasn't really yet learned to handle some of that outside uh, breaking stuff, as the Red Sox scouts have reported. Two balls and two strikes. And look where Petroselli is, Dick. He's right on top of the third base line. And a chopper to shortstop and under the glove of Rick Burleson into left field. So Foster is on base. For the second time this afternoon, a base hit. Good point just made by Kurt Dick Stockton. Seventh inning, protecting the line. 
He had been a little off as he ordinarily would have been playing early in the ballgame. He might have had a chance as it, as it was a little bit of a chopper. Burleson has some good range, but I don't know if they would have gotten him anyway, even if he would have uh, made the play. Four hits now off Tion. A conference at the mound as Concepcion comes up. He struck out on a sidearm slow curve last time up. He's 0 for 2. You've got to believe the way these two pitchers are pitching that we're going to see Concepcion up there trying to bunt. Rico's looking toward Cooper will have to charge and of course the place to go might be toward Cooper at first he has to hold that runner close on first base. Let's see what Sparky does. And Concepcion hitting away fouls off the first pitch. You get that ball high out over the plate Concepcion can drill it in the deep right center. He can also pull the ball. He can be dangerous. Some consider him the best fastball hitter on this Cincinnati club. We just can't get it by him. Louis Tion, who shut out the Cleveland Indians to just about wrap up the division title in September. He makes his definite stop. And Concepcion loops one to left field. Yastrzemski coming on and makes it back. Paul Yastrzemski, 36 years old, coming on and covering left field. As he says, he plays it in his sleep. Here's Kyle. We mentioned earlier he has the ability to play a very shallow left field in this park, unlike Foster, who will play deep to play the long. Kurt? Here's another angle. He used to be a shortstop in the minor league. He can really charge a ball. Great body control. Year after year, he used to lead the American League in assists. He does it all out there. They said Al Simmons was the best before him playing left field. This one ranks right along with Simmons. One out and Ken Griffey twice has bounced out once to Doyle the other time to Petroselli lays off an outside pitch. You know Dick uh, a lot has been made of the hitting of both ball clubs but the defense of both of these clubs many players on both teams will admit got him here or helped a great deal. First six innings of this game we have seen uh, Fine defensive play. Not too many spectacular plays, but of course you have to make the routine ones, and both clubs have done just that. Fastball. Tion snuck one by Griffey in the count one and one. It's brightened up a bit here at Fenway Park. We had some light showers when we started today. Looked overcast, but it's now brightened up. The lights have been turned on since the start of the game. And Petroselli's in tight again against Griffey and crowding the third baseline. He doesn't want anything to go down that line. Burleson and Doyle communicating as the Red Sox looking for the possible double play. And there goes the runner, the pitch out, the throw to second, and they've got him. George Foster, who only had two stolen bases this year, is thrown out Carlton Fisk in the first attempt by the Reds. He looked like he might have had a pretty good jump. When Tion gets all wound up, he can take a little time getting the ball to home plate. But what a great throw. And Kurt, you said it earlier, one of the finest catchers in baseball. And Fisk just proved a little of that. Now, this is Tion against Gullet and Bench against Fisk today. Look at this throw. Something on it. And a broken arm to start the season. Well, you got to feel good after you throw the first guy out. Fouls it off. Out of play. And it's two and two to Griffey. Carlton Fisk, who will meet the challenge. I think enough people talk to him about the base stealing threats of the Cincinnati Reds and before that the Oakland A's that I think Fisk inside and privately says, I'm going to rise to the occasion. Two and two to Ken Griffey. Two out. Nobody on. We're in the top of the seventh inning. No score. And a line drive. Base hit in the corner. Let's see how Evans plays this right field wall. Griffey will... Go into second with a double. And you see the advantage of that uh, attempt and that throw by Carlton Fisk because otherwise the Reds with one out would have had a big threat going. And how much bigger Yastrzemski's catch in left field looks right now. Mm -hmm. Right. The Red Sox have had more chances. They've left eight on. Up until this inning, the Reds have left four on. But now the Reds are starting to challenge. They have given Tiant more problems in this inning than any inning. They've had a hit in the fourth, fifth, a double in the sixth, and two hits here. 
And they're going to put Geronimo on as they did in the fifth inning and pitch to Don Gullett. And the red bullpen is quiet. They're going to leave Gullett in. These are the kind of decisions that the fans here at Fenway Park have not seen this year because of the DH. That's what the National League argues that this is the strategy of baseball that's taken away with a designated hitter. The American League argues that it keeps hitters like Billy Williams in the game. There's Gullet. He'll come up to bat now. Maybe during the season they might have done something different, but he wants him in here. He's had a shutout going at Fenway, and he's his best pitcher, so Sparky goes with him. Sparky Anderson looking for his first world championship. 35. Runners at first and second, two down, and the pitcher Don Gullet, last time up. After Geronimo was passed intentionally, he fouled out to Petroselli. 0 for 2 is Gullet. But a fine all round athlete. At nine runs batted in this season. Fastball on the outside corner. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. Dick Stockton with Kurt Gowdy and Tony Kubek. No score. Two out. Top of the seventh inning, two men on for the Reds. Right. One after the high pitch, fouled into the mid of Fisk, and Tion is ahead of his opposite number of two strikes. Tion has to be very careful now, and his manager knows it, not to come in here with a fat pitch against Gullick. Gullick can hit for a pitcher. If he eases up on him, he can get in trouble. Two strikes. And there is a ball that's caught by him. Tough play for Doyle. He had to go to his left, and he saved a run with that catch. And Gullet is out. A great tumbling catch early in the inning by Yastrzemski may have saved a run or a big inning. And now Denny Doyle, a fiery second baseman who sparked this club earlier in the year, makes a fine play on the slicing ball hit to his right. Down there in the commissioner's box, we have... Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Simon with us today. Secretary of Treasurer, Commissioner and Mrs. Kuhn, Mr. and Mrs. Tip O'Neill, Senator Brook, Mrs. Brook, Herb Slosser, the president of NBC, Bob McCurry of the Chrysler Corporation, Bill Salatich, President Gillette. And without them, we wouldn't all be sitting here, I'll tell you. Say, you covered every angle you possibly could right there. Let's get those sponsors in. I want those sponsors in there. <laughs> One ball and one strike to count to Louis Tion, who walked his last time up, struck out back in the second inning. Big cut, fouls it back on the screen. It's interesting, though. Uh, McCurry was an All-American player and captain at Michigan State in football, and Bill Salatich used to be a minor league pitcher. Now they rise in the corporate ranks. And a base hit for Tion. <laughs> Standing ovation for Louis. Bill has got him a slow curve, and Louis gets a base hit. They love him here, don't they? And oh, here goes the chant. They want him to steal, too, and he might. <laughs> nah, he won't, I don't think. Here it is, a slow curve that Tion pulled to the left side and threw the hole for a base hit. That is the eighth hit off Don Gullett. And the leadoff man is on here in the last of the seventh inning of a scoreless game and the top of the order, Dwight Evans. Not everyone watching this game around Boston paid their way in as you could see and that's got to be a very precarious perch for the fans in center field. Dick that was Louis Tion's first hit since 1972. And I'm sure he remembers it. There's the bunt by Evans the sacrifice and the throw to second oh. is in the dirt in the center field. Tion will hold it second. Oh. Gullah took a gamble tried to get the lead <laughs> man and it backfired. Oh, uh, he's something. And the Red Sox have runners at first and second. Nobody out. Gullet is an excellent fielder. He got off the mound very well. And then he looked like he took too much time. Right here, he says, I've got him dead. He threw a sinker ball to Concepcion covering. Very alertly, Geronimo backs the play up, keeping Tiot at second base. And then almost going behind him and picking him off. So the first mistake we've seen in this ball game. This, this, uh, we're going to wonder what this may take out of Tion, hitting the dirt, running the bases, getting up, scrambling back. We'll see what it does to him when he comes out for the eighth inning. Right now, the Sox have runners on first and second. 
Nobody out. And this is a scoreless game, and they're batting in their home half the seven. And if Dwight Evans was uh, bunting to move the man over to second, you know that Denny Doyle will definitely be bunting here with runners at first and second. Perez at first and Rose at third are playing in, looking for the sacrifice attempt. They tell me he rarely failed to get a runner over in this kind of situation all year long. He pops this bunt foul and out of play. That's rare to see him pop up and attempt a bunt. He was practically flawless in sacrifice situations this year. Has helped the Red Sox so many ways. In fact, when he joined the club in Kansas City in the very first game he played, Hal McCray barreled into him on a double play, and Doyle got rid of the ball nonetheless and turned it over, and the Red Sox knew they had a good second baseman. Doug Griffin, who had been playing second, of course, played better after Doyle arrived. He's had a fine year. Tony, uh, he put into first base where he sacrificed in the first. I think he wants to draw Rose off the bag at third on this bunt. Let's see what he does. Activity in the Cincinnati bullpen. A left-hander and a right-hander. Doyle swinging away. Misses and it's two strikes. I'm surprised right there that Daryl Johnson went against the percentages even with one strike. Doyle is a good bat handler. There is Carroll the right-hander. McEnany the left-hander. Going for the Reds. The left-handed pitcher on there uh, makes it tougher for Doyle. Darrell Johnson quiet does not make many headlines and he stops it in the left field for a base hit Tion will hold it third and the bases are loaded nobody out just slapped it to the left side and no way Don Zimmer was going to send Tion but the Red Sox have the best opportunity that either side has had right now and they have their captain coming up Carl Yastrzemski Gullet can be so good, he's become more of a pitcher than a thrower in recent years, but in the second inning with first and third, he went to a strikeout pitch as he reached back for a little extra so he can get the strikeouts when he needs them. Yastrzemski was the leading Boston hitter in the 1967 series, had three homers and hit 400. And here he is up with the bases loaded, nobody out, last of the seventh inning. Big cut by Carl, and he misses. It's interesting to see they're playing a shortstop and second baseman about halfway. What they do with a ground ball, they probably try and turn it over for the double play and let the run come on in. At the corners, he'll come home. One strike pitch in the dirt, and Johnny Bench stops it. One and one. They know they don't have an experienced base runner in T on at third. Here's Bench. Two men exceptional at receiving behind the plate. Bench looked like a fork ball or a curve ball, keeping the ball in front of him. They're playing back for the double play at short and second base because they don't want a big inning right here. They come in, the ball gets by, and the Red Sox may have something big going. Play him more straight away to the outfield. And it's a line drive, right field, coming on Griffey. It's a hit. Tion coming in. Here comes the throw, oh. cut off by oh. Perez. Oh, Johnny wanted it to go through. He missed the plate. He, I, I didn't see him touch the plate. He missed the plate and went back and touched it. Concepcion was yelling the, the plate. Concepcion yelling to Perez, throw the ball, throw the ball, but Tion yes, went sir. back and touched home. We get a rerun. You'll see him miss the plate when he crosses it. And the Red Sox have broken the scoreless tie. Let's look at it again. Here's Louis. Zimmer has him back tagged up on a short fly ball. Now, Louis does not run well, obviously. Hadn't seen third base or home plate very often. Bench is yelling to Perez. Let the ball come. We got a chance. Now, Louis. Hey, wait a second. Concepcion, anyway, doesn't think I do I, have, do I have to touch home? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell. Did he lick the corner of it first time? So uh, Yastrzemski drives in the first run of the game, and Sparky Anderson has gone to the mound, and uh, we will see a new pitcher, Clay Carroll, coming in for Don Gullet. And Yastrzemski continues to do it at the age of 36, suddenly catching fire. When they're dangling that money out there in the playoffs, he's made a spectacular play today. He's just come up with a first RBI. And now you have to wonder what's going to be with Peon in the eighth. He's scrambled and run and shoved and all over these baselines. Will it uh, wear him out? We have a break in the action here with a score now. The Red Sox won and the Reds nothing. And there is Joe Garagiola and Marty Brenneman, the Cincinnati Reds broadcaster. 
doing the radio broadcast of this first World Series game, and you'll be seeing Marty on television and Joe as well throughout this World Series. Ned Martin, who is the radio voice of the Boston Red Sox, will be here tomorrow afternoon. Clay Carroll in his 10th World Series game, pitching to Carlton Fisk. Outside, ball one. Bases are loaded, nobody out. Perez is on the edge of the grass at first. Carroll's World Series record is 1-1, one and one, an ERA of 0.61. That's in the World Series. On the corner. Good sinker ball, good hard slider. He's a power pitcher, and Dick and Kurt, both teams all year long, were noted for taking advantage of mistakes by the opposition. The Red Sox do it now in the wild throw by Gullick. And Fisk goes after a pitch on the outside edge of the plate, misses one and two. I was surprised that Doyle and Yastrzemski hit Gullet. Both left-handers they stood right in there to him. Well, Darrell Johnson went with four left-handed batters against Vida Blue and Ken Holtzman. Fisk looks at an outside pitch, and the count is even two and two. The runner at third is Dwight Evans. At second, Denny Doyle and Carl Yastrzemski with an RBI single is on at first. One nothing, the Red Sox lead. They have out hit the Reds 10 to 5. Three balls and two strikes. They have no place to put Carlton Fisk. Darrell Johnson quietly looking on. Pedro Borbon has replaced Clay Carroll in the bullpen. Will McEnany, the left hander, still working with him. The payoff pitch. Way outside. And Clay Carroll forces in a run. It's two to nothing, Boston, as Evans comes across. And still nobody out. The left hander Lynn scheduled up. Sparky may pop up very quickly. He's got McEnany. He should be loose. Here comes Anderson. Here he comes. Odd thing. Five of the Red Sox ten hits against Gullet were by left handed batters. Cecil Cooper, Denny Doyle, and of course Fred Lynn can hit left handers. And we're now we're going to see Will McEnany who along with Raleigh Eastwick two young relievers who have done the job for the Cincinnati Reds this year. Two they batters. also have Pedro Barbon and Clay Carroll who departs here after facing one batter Carlton Fisk and walking him with the bases loaded. So the Red Sox lead it two to nothing. Bases remain loaded. Nobody out. Fred Lynn will be the hitter. I want to remind our viewers that tonight at 11:30 Eastern 10:30 Central NBC's Saturday night a live comedy variety show it debuts this week with special guest host George Carlin in the weeks ahead you'll see Paul Simon with special guests are Art Garfunkel and also Bob Reiner from all in the family fame it's live it's tonight from New York City right here on NBC Louis Tiant right now is the man of this game along with Carl Yastrzemski Tion started this inning with a single. He went to second, slid into second, then had a scramble back. He nearly ran in second. He went to third. He scored. We'll see how he does in the eighth inning. Yastrzemski's made a spectacular catch, and he's driven in the first run. And there's Louie. Uh, Louie is uh, using some smelling salts in there in the dugout. You know, he's not used to running the bases. You pointed out what's it going to be like when we'll he comes see. out for the eighth inning. And a long delay here. It's a long inning, and it's damp and chilly here at Fenway Park. Sparky Anderson was conferring with Concepcion and Morgan uh, while McEnany's been warming up. Dick and Kurt, in recent years, we haven't seen many complete games. In fact, not any complete games since when, Alan Roth. But they said that the key to this series could be the bullpen, which is so important in a short series, and they always give the edge the Cincinnati Reds. But your bullpen did a good job, especially Draco and late will it be in the middle of the year well McEnany is 23 years old a native of Springfield Ohio he is six feet tall weighs 180 pounds was the uh, ace of the Reds bullpen most of the year you see his record very impressive and he became a father for the first time yesterday his wife Lynn gave birth to a girl faith in Good Samaritan Hospital in Cincinnati Fred Lynn with the bases loaded and a let up curve in for the strike. Now Dick Stockton, the infield alignment has changed. Sparky Anderson has brought Concepcion and Morgan even a little tighter in the field. He cannot afford to give any more runs up. Lynn holds up. Sporting News has already named him the Rookie of the Year and the American League Player of the Year. His dad is here. His dad taught him how to play baseball. 
and Rod Dado at Southern Cal. Lynn had 47 doubles, establishing a new American League rookie mark. Fastball by McEnany on the outside corner. Dado's also here today. In fact, Dado broke in Georgie Anderson. Sparky, he was the bat boy out there for five years for Rod Dado. One ball, two strikes. Lynn has been vulnerable to sliders from left-handed pitchers this season. And he swings and misses for strike three. And that's the first out here in the seventh inning. McEnany coming in and striking out Lynn, but now he'll face the right-handed hitting Rico Petroselli. Pedro Borbon has been heating up in the Reds' bullpen, and we look to the dugout to see if uh, any traces of Sparky Anderson. Petroselli doubled his last time up. He's one for two, and he walked back in the second inning. There's Borbon. Doyle is at third. Yastrzemski at second. Fisk at first. Two runs in here in the seventh inning. Almost got away from bench. Petroselli has been a clutch hitter, mostly breaking ball in the last couple of years, but he's been hitting fastballs in the last month. Hit a big home run against uh, Raleigh Fingers to give uh, the Red Sox an edge. Here's a base hit to left field. Doyle scores. They're going to send Yastrzemski. Here's the throw to the plate. It's cut off. Two more runs score. It's four to nothing, Red Sox. And not a very strong throw by George Foster. It's very shallow out in left field. The scouting reports that Frank Malzo and Eddie Casco put together warned about the arm of Cesar Geronimo in center. They said, Foster, you might be able to run a little bit. He could be inaccurate. That was not a strong throw. Well, it's ironical that the only two members of the 67 championship team, Yastrzemski and Petroselli, have turned into stars again in the playoffs. And a World Series. No playoffs back then. They found their 67 days again. These are the players who rise to the occasion. The veterans, the youngsters do the do it all season long, but when it comes to the big game, somehow they know they've been there before and they're calm. Here's Burleson, takes outside for a ball. Petroselli with two hits has been on base three times. He's on at first. Carlton Fist, the runner at second. Four runs here for the Red Sox in the seventh inning. They lead it four to nothing. Burleson has two hits in a wall. He takes ball two. This is just the way the Red Sox played against Oakland. Exactly, Kirk. They played fundamental sound baseball, good pitching, underrated pitching, fine, fine defensive play, and then when they had the opportunity, took advantage. It's 3-0 to Rick. Don Zimmer flashing the signs, and since McEnany has had problems with his control, I would think that Burleson would be taking on 3-0, and but you never know. I don't know. With Cooper coming up, a left-handed hitter, left-hander on the mound, I think he might let Burleson take a swat at He's been a good clutch hitter for you all year. And a base hit left field. Fisk coming around. Here's the throw to the plate. And scoring is Fisk going to second. Safe there is Burleson. And there is something you rarely see Cincinnati do. Rose was in the cutoff position. No chance for a play at the plate. They let the ball go through, and that enabled Burleson to keep going to second. Like the championship series, they are very aggressive. As we see Concepcion diving for the ball, they are running on George Foster. It is shallow and left. Took a lot of time. That's what the scouting report said. He has a strong throwing arm, accurate, but he takes a lot of time to get rid of the ball. Right here, they mess up a cutoff play. Burleson very alertly going to second. Tony, you can't miss the cutoff, man. The Oakland A's did it a couple of times. The Red Sox have only missed maybe once or twice all year. And this is why it hurts. And Burleson taking advantage of it. Second and third, the infield is in. Cooper hits a long drive, right field. Going back as Griffey on the warning track. Makes the catch. Both runners will tag. Petroselli scores. Burleson to third. It's a six to nothing game. Boy, any other day, that's up in the bleachers. That ball was hit against the wind. And look at the Red Sox bench. This is a team that has had its ha unhappiness during the course of the year. They've been irate at Gerald Johnson at times. Nostremski left the club, some said, without permission just before the championship series. They're pulling together now. He came back to play. Louis Tion fouls it off, and it was Tion who started it all here in the seventh inning with a base hit as Borbone heats up in the Reds' bullpen. The Red Sox batting around with six runs. Here in the seventh inning. Archie Anderson has to be disappointed in his bullpen today. 
They have not been effective. Carroll and McEnany. Here's Jim Rice. What a job he did this year for the Red Sox. Tion pops it up. Perez in front of the Red Sox dugout makes the catch for the third out. But listen to the hand. The Red Sox come up with six runs to break a scoreless tie. Boy, you have to have courage to do that. Corey Lively will go anywhere to get this shot right here for you, looking right down the right field line. Dick Stockton with Kurt Gotti and Tony Kubek. The Red Sox with six runs in the seventh inning as we go to the eighth here. And Pete Rose, 0 for 3 against Louis Tiano, has some breathing room. Lines it to center field. Lynn makes the catch. A cliche. The game is never over till the last out. But where does it apply more than right here at Fenway Park, Boston? Kurt, how no many place. times you used to do the Red Sox games? Did you see oh, seven, seen, eight run leads disappear? I, I saw one game there, 11 runs by the Red Sox in the last of the ninth inning. But uh, the wind is in today. Some of those high-scoring games in the late innings, the wind goes out. The wind blowing in, as I keep saying, the wind is such a factor in this park. Cincinnati's offense this afternoon has rested on the shoulders of Morgan and Foster, each with two hits. Morgan, a single and a double, takes strike one. Red Sox do have activity in their bullpen, just in case Tion begins to falter. Oh. And the let-up pitch is outside. Crowd loves all of the deliveries, all of the pitches and moves by El Tiante. He won 18 games this year. There was a glove move I never saw before. He's trying to wave <laughs> the glove in Morgan's face. I think the story right now is whether or not Tiant can complete this game. If, in fact, he wins it, we can't assume that. That pitch is low. But since 1971 in World Series play, there's not been a complete ball game. Of course, Fingers and Knowles being in so many for Oakland, but the last one was Steve Blass by in 1971. The 3-1 pitch to Joe Morgan is in for the strike. He was taking. Reds are down by six runs. Jim Burton, a left-hander, and Dick Drago, a fireballing right-hander in the Red Sox bullpen. He's walked only two. They've both been intentional. Both Cesar Geronimo. And there's a fly ball in the right field. Dwight Evans has the play. Two down. He continues to upset the Cincinnati Reds' timing. And with the Red Sox scoring six in the seventh, it was the biggest series inning since the Orioles Five. scored six against the Pirates in the bottom of the fifth of the second game of their series. The Reds were shut out only five times this season, the lowest total in the National League. Johnny Bench, fly to right, fouled out to Fisk and bounced to Petroselli. Tiant can toy with hitters when he has a lead like this in the late innings. But Cincinnati is explosive. Burleson on one hop. Side is retired. So Tiant responds to the six-run inning by retiring the Reds in order in the eighth. The Red Sox lead it six to nothing. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Dwight Evans, who has a hit in uh, three trips officially and sacrificed his last time up and was safe when Gullett threw the ball away in second base in the center field. McEnany, the third Cincinnati pitcher. Second baseman Morgan coming in. And Evans is retired. Don Gullett started for the Reds today, worked six innings plus, allowed four runs on ten hits. Walked four and struck out three. Clay Carroll came in and faced one batter, Carlton Fisk, but he walked him with the bases loaded. And then McEnany has given up a run on two hits. And Tion in the ninth will face three right-handed batters, Perez, Foster, and Concepcion. And Dick Drago is warming up in the Red Sox bullpen. He'll be called upon if Louie runs into trouble. Here's Denny Doyle, two for three with a sacrifice and a score to run. Stride. There's Drago, who is incredible. And that's the best word to describe Drago's pitching in games two of three of the American League Championship Series. Sneaks in a fastball on Doyle, 0 2 the count. And Denny Doyle's wife, who started the season along with Denny in California, now finds themselves in a World Series 
And her husband has two hits in this first game. A little moolah, <laughs> a little fur coat maybe. And you know what? The Red Sox players voted Denny Doyle a full share. Even though he played half the year, he deserved it. And Burton and Willoughby too. Full share. Well, they should have. They helped contribute and put him in here. Two balls, two strikes to Doyle with one out. Bottom of the eighth. Full count. Tomorrow on television, Joe Garrett, Joel will be working with Tony and my old broadcasting partner, Ned Martin, a very popular broadcaster and radio with the Red Sox. And Ned's in back of the booth. Good luck tomorrow, Ned. And Doyle draws a walk. Ned's been with the Red Sox 16 years. <laughs> he has seen it all. This is a standing ovation for Carl Yastrzemski. He made a great catch in left field and he drove in the first run of the game. And he made a fine diving catch of a fly ball with a runner on Foster in the seventh inning and that preceded a double by Griffey and that was a big play. Fouls it out of play to the left side. And they were booing him here earlier in the season. You hear a lot about a base hit getting a team going but I think many more times or as many times a great defensive play as Yastrzemski pulled off will spur a team on and that may have helped the Red Sox. Got him up. In for the strike 0 and 2 to Carl. Well the Cincinnati Reds have 15 players with World Series experience. The Red Sox only three Estremsky and Petroselli who have contributed and Bernie Carbo. A ball and two strikes. Borbone and, Dar and Darcy a pair of right handers in the Reds bullpen and Dick Drago was up and he is now seated in the Boston bullpen. Carl one for three an RBI single. Borbone closest to the camera. Fouls it off. It's still one and two. Yastrzemski had one big hot streak as we look at Denny Doyle at first this season. I think he raised his average curt something like uh, 60 or 70 points. He had a separated left shoulder at the end of the year that bothered his swing. He played hurt. And it's caught by Perez. Steps on the back for the double play and the side is retired. Well nothing Denny Doyle could do about that one. We go to the ninth inning here at Fenway Park. The Red Sox have a six run lead. And is this man overjoyed? 70 year old, very dapper Louis Tiant Sr. El Tiant, number one, is watching El Tiant, number two, on the mound, going into the ninth inning with a shutout. Let's see what happens, Dick. Tony Perez will lead it off, and as you mentioned, three right handed batters against Tiant, and Dick Drago is warming up the right hander, and Jim Burton, the left hander, just in case. Perez has struck out twice and lines this first pitch to center field Freddie Lynn does he go get him Kirk uh, he's, he glides after the ball this is the best young player the Red Sox have had since Carl Yastrzemski came up with a rookie in 1960 very deceiving he just glides he's there it makes him look easy. Here's George Foster has two of the five hits for Cincinnati. Joe Morgan has the other two and Griffey has the fifth. One out in the ninth inning. Special thanks to our statistician Alan Roth, production stage manager Jim O'Gorman, and our field supervisor Hugh McDermott. Red Sox are playing. You can close your eyes and watch them against the A's a week ago today, the way they play. Kurt, they've been underrated from spring training on. No one thought they'd handle the pressure by the Orioles. Foster fouls it off. Well, I said uh, playoff pressure world. So what do you mean? We had more pressure from Baltimore than from anyone. Every time we looked up they were winning and we had to beat them off. There was the pressure. Strike one pitch and it's popped up. Doyle is going out and he'll call for it. Two down. Remember tomorrow grandstand and the World Series football doubleheader. Beginning at 12:30, Joe Garagiola will have an artistic look at the World Series. And yep. the Reds and the Red Sox, followed by the Oakland Raiders against the Kansas City Chiefs, two of the most heated rivals in professional football. All on NBC, starting at 12:30 tomorrow afternoon. Two out. Here's Concepcion. Takes a fastball. Strike one. They want to. They want a strikeout. The hometown fans want to see him end it with a flourish. Robbed of a hit last time up by Carl Yastrzemski. Two down. That's the hesitation job. 
Tiad went into this ninth inning with no earned runs allowed in his last 35 innings at Fenway Park. One ball, one strike to Concepcion, two out, top of the ninth, six to nothing to score. And the Reds are down to their last strike. One ball, two strikes. Crowd on its feet here at Fenway on an overcast raw day. And Petroselli gloves it. But no in time. And the Red Sox have drawn first blood in the 1975 World Series. Louis Tiant, with the help of a six-run seventh, spins a five-hit shutout to give the Sox the victory. Dick, they played a flawless game. They just can't make a mistake in the field. That last play by Petroselli was a sparkler. Yastrzemski, Freddie Lynn, they're taking the extra base. They're doing everything that the book says you're supposed to do to play baseball. And but these Red Sox players, Kurt, like to be the underdogs. They like to know that somebody feels that the other club will win. They handle the Baltimore pressure, as you mentioned, beat Oakland in three straight games to the three-time defending champs, and there you see Louis Tion getting congratulations and a whale of a game for him. Well, I figured him the key of this series. If he lost here today, I think the Reds would have been heavily favored. We'll be back right after this message. 